So the question is, how do we connect all of this together? We've been talking from rootstock to clones to regions, adaptations, challenges, solutions. At the end of the day, the person who's buying the bottle of wine is the consumer. So how do we share this information? How do we make sure that nothing gets lost, that everything along the way that is essential uh, is kept? Pascaline, I sense you're burning, so I think I'm going to start with you. <laughs> OK. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing I'm, I'm the table, right? Um, <laughs> I'm going to give you just two seconds on my background. Um, because I, I think it's one of the reasons you asked me to be here, because I'm, I'm a sommelier, but I think I'm a kind of little bit uh, I just assume strange sommelier. You're the rock star, yeah. <laughs> you go. So um, I, I grew up in the Loire Valley. I've been in touch with wine quite late after studying philosophy, which I think helped me a lot about uh, asking a lot of questions in my practices and uh, putting back a lot of, um, um, you know, really interrogating what I was doing. And that's really because I was doing philosophy. So I grew up in Loire, went to wine, and grew up in a region where we have a lot of movement of organic and biodynamic farming, which I studied and tasted and visited very early on in my career as I was working also in Michelin star restaurant and following a very, very classic background to Michelin star, tasting classic wines like from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s with like extraordinary cellar while I was also tasting during the weekend a lot of old natural winemaker. I'm talking about 2000 and I started in 2005, so I 14 years in the stuff. So um, I was on my way to go to start competition too, so very, you know, going into very hard. And at one point I had a choice to continue my career and I could become a, a, a sommelier in a two Michelin star restaurant, but I got hired by a company uh, and I decided to change kind of, this was my first decision to change my career and to say I really want to do something a little bit different in the wine industry. I just don't want to sell wine for the 1%. So I'm realizing there's a lot of um, issue with a certain type of parameter we are giving to certain wine. And I was growing in a region with certain grape variety was not, you know, the top grape variety of the world. You know, Muscadet, Melon Bourgogne, uh, you drink Montrachet, you know. Well, I'm gonna, don't drink Melon Bourgogne, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and so um, I was very lucky because I got contacted by a, a Belgian company. Uh, and instead of going into becoming a two Michelin star so head sommelier, they said, you know, we're interested by you. We are building that program for a restaurant in New York, and uh, it's going to be in a year, and I would like you to build a beverage program. The whole thing is about Sanitas per Escam. We want to build a new model of, of restaurant where you will eat better, really at a high quality of food in terms of aesthetics and gastronomy, but there will be a, 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 also a nutritional parameter, not in terms of calories, but in terms of nutritional density. So what you're going to put in your plate is going to be richer, is going to be more satisfying. And we also want to do that in a green restaurant way. We want to build a restaurant and we want to operate the restaurant in a green restaurant. Are you on to take the beverage program? Are you interested to develop that? And it was like two Michelin star, Rouge Tomate, nobody knew about it. Well, I said, I'm going to Rouge Tomate. I spent a year working with nutritionists, scientists to build the beverage program. We opened New York and I took the challenge in. What does that mean to you? It was in 2008. What does it mean to drink good, to operate a restaurant where, in fact, you are my guests, you are coming. You don't need to know everything I'm doing. I just need to have you have a great time, family, dates, business, dinner, whatever. You don't necessarily need to know what we are doing, but what we are going to do, we are going to provide you with an experience where we really thought about every single detail of what's going to come into your plate and your glass. And it made me study so hard to think, what should we drink? How should we buy? What does that mean at every level? So he started with the farming. Um, what are the impact of pesticide use in vineyard? Do we find them in a wine? You know, and I had a nutritionist team and scientist team with me to help me to build that. Uh, what about additives into your wine? What does that mean? Uh, is the impact on the health? How much alcohol can we consume? Can we consume alcohol? If we consume alcohol, how much for women, how much for men? Do we need to put that on the menu? Um, how do we do that with spirits, with beer, with everything? And then the question, once you go that part, is like, what about, that was a health part. Um, the question after that was a green part. What does that mean when you open a restaurant in New York to do that? 
what does it mean in terms of cardboard footprint? How am I going to build my wine list in an Upper East Side, which is like super wealthy environment? We have a lot of ambition, a lot of money. What does that mean? Do I need to have this wine on my list? What, what about me getting wine from Europe or from Australia to the restaurant? What about the cardboard footprint? Okay, let's go to the locaver movement. I'm in New York. You know what? I'm going to develop the locaver movement. 2008, in a restaurant that has a lot of ambition, that got a Michelin star within eight months, I started to put on a lot of New York wine. Try to sell New York wine on the Upper East Side in New York in 2008. Uh, you do that, and then you realize a lot of New York wine are not organic, or there is, there is a lot of, it's extremely difficult to grow Vitis vinifera in Northeast America for obvious reasons. A lot of the pests we know are from that area. It's very complicated. So what do you, what do you take a cut? Do you take a cut into the green movement, or do you have to, to take a cut into using certain pesticide? What, what's the choice? Okay, maybe we should drink differently. We should drink something else. What about cider? New York grows cider, is, cider is like weed, you know, you should drink cider. Try to have people drink cider in New York. <laughs> it's impossible. No, it's not impossible, it's possible. And then I went on and went on and was like, okay, I really want to have New York wine, and I discovered that 75% of the finger legs um, are grown hybrids. And I was like, if I really want to have an organic wine from New York for my restaurant that I can put in keg, try to sell wine in keg. Before that, in 2008, we started the program to be green and friendly. I had someone in bagging box on the floor of my restaurant. Uh, no, no, seriously. I, we, st we studied everything to be as green as possible. It was just impossible for us to sell bagging box wine on the Upper East Star in a Michelin star restaurant. We had two, and we, we really pushed them super, super hard. But even the choice was not there. So I went to, to I was like, I really want to have an organic wine for, I want kind of to check all the boxes for my restaurant. And I discovered the past of New York wine industry. And 75% are hybrids and 25% is unifera. And among these hybrids, you have original hybrids um, that are called natives, they have like American name, Delaware and Catoba, you know? And, and I was like, man, they are here, they're 150 years old vines, they are not treated, some of them are organically certified. I can, make, I can ask somebody to make wine like that without anything added, including sulfites, that I can put in a keg and I can have in my restaurant. And we did it. And we did it because I realized that you can change parameters on how the guests are drinking. What I could do with my keg, it took me, was 2008, it took me eight years to make that happen. But what I realized is within these eight years, two things. Me, as a sommelier, I was not trained to ask the right questions. We are trained and we are very, very good about learning appellation and grape variety and minimum alcohol percentage and all that. We lack an incredible amount of knowledge in viticulture and winemaking that are crucial. Because when you come to my restaurant, you are trusting me to give you something good. You are trusting me to give you some things that are not going to hurt you. Feeding people is a, such an important act. I can poison you. You know, I, really, I deeply believe in that. And I realized, man, I don't understand how grapes are grown. And when I ask the question, I'm told, you can't understand our spray, our spray program. Like, you can't understand the molecule. Or you can't understand why I'm using this additive to the wine. And I realized, we are not trained. So I realized I had to train myself to be able to really understand what was happening to make an educated guest. Because the problem is we don't tell, we don't, we don't know what's happening. We have a massive issue of, Transparency, I'm sorry. We have a big issue of transparency. We can talk about carbon footprint, but the rest is a kind of dirty secret in the business. We are selling the marketing on that. So I realized that. I realized us, we have to ask our distributor, our importer, our winemaker to have more transparency to really understand what they are doing so we can't support them. And we can understand why they are doing certain choices. That's the first thing. And the second thing I realized is our guests, they don't really know what they want to drink. Um, no, in a very, very respectful way. They want to drink good wine. Of course, certain people, they want to drink Cabernet Sauvignon or Pinot. They may want to drink Von Romane or all that. But you realize quickly they really want to drink good wine unless you are talking about the one-person label drinker. And they are really exciting to try something new. If you really listen to what they want, one day it's a big, powerful, juicy wine. Awesome. Do you want to try something new? What about this Carignan from the, from the Languedoc? 
or you want something fresh and kind of a light Grenache, what about this Oyad that you never heard of that I can offer you at a very low price on my wine list? And suddenly you realize you have to open up your box like crazy. And instead of trying to just sell the 13 main grape variety from the top grower, from the top region, because it's a name you need to have because they are easily recognizable and they are easily sellable. You have to open up and your guests are ready for that. I know it's kind of idealistic, and I say that because I'm a, single, I'm a, I'm a sommelier on the floor of my restaurant. On purpose, I decided as a career that I wanted to be on my floor, and I wanted to go one bottle at a time to have that explanation to my guests. Uh, but I deeply believe um, this is not impossible to say that. And I think in terms of the climate change, it's just for me one point of a, of, of a way bigger com conversation. And two days, that bigger conversation, this is what I learned at Rouge, is less is more. At the end, the problem is we are spoiled. We are spoiled. We are in a luxury industry where we are over-consuming. We want things all the time at a good price, where we may should learn a bit more moderation. You can't get everything all the time. You can't get a bottle of Morache every single day. You know, like, you need to learn to rediscover things around because at the end, the pleasure you can get has been really culturally built. Our parameters, what today are Grand Cru, or top wine, are cultural, like greed, that are current to our period of time. You read about what was drunk 150 years ago, it was different. So this is, this is my, my contribution to that, and I think my, my point is two things. Respect my guests, educate my guests to open back their palate. They can taste so much more. There is so much more available closely and more further, all grape varieties, the nobility of so many grape varieties that nobody really cares about because they are not bankable. There is so many beautiful grape varieties that we need to rediscover. Aburiu, Fer Servadou, I can tell you more and more and more. That's the thing. And me, as a sommelier, as a wine buyer, I need to ask questions to the people making the wine and I need to ask for more transparency. Thank you. Um, Lilian was, Lilian could not fully understand, but he was timing you and he said you went way over. <laughs> that was fantastic. We'll come back to you, uh, Pascal, in, and have a, a group discussion. Uh, I would like to move on to Lilian because um, I was thinking of you, uh, Lilian. Je vais parler en français, je vais traduire ensuite. Euh, Lilian, euh, je pensais beaucoup à toi aujourd'hui parce qu'évidemment, euh, c'était en anglais, c'était difficile, mais il y avait tellement de points euh, qui ramenaient un peu à toi dans les discussions. Euh, et, et je sais que moi, euh, je, je connaissais ton travail, mais quand je suis allée te visiter pour la première fois cette année, je suis allée quelques fois maintenant, euh, on est tellement déconnecté du monde végétal, et pourtant, c'est là que ça commence. Et... et on demande aux producteurs, et à de très grands producteurs, très réputés, qu'est-ce qu'ils font, quel type de, de greffe ils ont, ils, ils connaissent pas, et c'est étonnant. Et, euh, et donc, euh, je vais traduire en anglais, et ensuite, tu pourras répondre à la question, ça va? Uh, I was just saying that it was interesting, there's so many points being talked about today that concern Lilian, and I was saying, I knew what the, the work of Lilian before, and he's going to talk about it. Um, and when I went to visit, I, I went to visit him a few times this year, And I was just shocked when I got to the nursery. And I know you don't like when I call it the nursery, but just for us now, we're going to call it the nursery until you, you define what you do. Um, a lot of really highly regarded producers, us who work in the wine industry, we often have no knowledge of where it starts, how it's made. Um, and I think we've done what you've done is so inspiring. And I'm just really thankful that you're here today. Um, So Lilian will speak in French, and then Jackie will be translating. Merci, Michel. Je suis d'abord très, très honoré de, de participer à cette manifestation. Ça prouve que le végétal prend, prend sa place. Et si on en parle aujourd'hui, ben j'en je suis, voilà, je, suis très fier. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, I'm very happy today uh, to be here with you, and I'm happy to see that people are beginning to become interested by planting material and its impact on uh, the vine. Alors, je, je vais expliquer un petit peu mon, mon parcours euh, euh, qui a démarré, euh, je dirais, il y a une vingtaine d'années. 
euh, je, je faisais des plans comme tous les autres pépiniéristes, avec des, des, des méthodes que, que je qualifie euh, euh, d'intensives. Uh, so I'm going to explain a little bit about my background to you. Uh, about 20 years ago, I was working as a nurseryman, but using traditional practices. Et, et mon, mon objectif était d'avoir mon, mon vignoble. C'était ma préoccupation d'être pépiniériste. Et c'est vraiment un, un pur accident. C'était pas prévu. Moi, je voulais faire du vin. C'était ma, ma préoccupation. Je, je vais en faire. Hein, je, mais bon. So my my dream, my ambition was to have my own vineyard. It wasn't to uh, own and run a nursery, and I still will make wine, but for now. Tout ça pour dire que je suis passionné, passionné par le vin. Et euh, un jour, euh, je, je rencontre un vigneron pr près de chez moi qui s'appelle Éloi Durbac, domaine de Trévalon. Uh, so one day, uh, I met a, a winery uh, close to me, whose name was. Éloi Durbac. Éloi Dumac. Et. Euh, Malgré la, la, la différence d'âge, il y a eu comme une espèce de, de flash entre nous. Et euh, Eloi a compris, euh, enfin, a compris ce que je voulais faire dans ce métier de la, de la pépinière viticole. Euh, je, je voulais, euh, je dirais, placer la barre un petit peu plus haute dans so les pratiques. So despite the age difference, there was something that, there was a current that passed between us, we understood each other. And right away he saw what it was that I wanted to do Uh, how I envisioned the future of a high quality nursery and what it could be to the vineyard. Et donc euh, un jour Telmo Rodriguez m'appelle pour me dire Lilian vient visiter les, les vieux cépages euh, de la Ribera del Duero. Donc je, je rejoins euh, Telmo, j'avais une petite voiture, une petite Renault 5, une, une Clio et, et, euh, et j'arrive à la Ribera del Duero et, et il me présente euh, 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 Peter, Peter Sisek chez Pingus qui me dit, mais enfin, quelqu'un qui veut vendre des plants un peu chers. <rire> je trouve ça très intéressant. Vous leur vendre plus cher, déjà, c'était... Et, et... So, sorry. Uh, so he came along to the, to the uh, nursery one day and he pr presented me to Peter Sisek. Uh, and who said, finally, quelqu'un qui voulait... Je n'ai pas entendu le fin. Enfin, quelqu'un qui veut qui veut vendre des plants un peu plus chers que les autres. Ah, finally somebody who wants to sell plants a little bit more expensive than the others. Et euh, peu après, euh, c'est Tempier, domaine Tempier, qui m'invite pour, euh, pour voir son vignoble de Mourvèdre. Et puis ensuite, euh, mais ce n'est pas besoin de traduire, parce que je pense qu'ils vont comprendre, je vais lâcher que des noms de vignerons. Et ça... ensuite... <rire> Et ensuite, ensuite, en, ensuite j'arrive au, au château Simone. Et puis, euh, puis j'arrive assez rapidement chez, chez Pierre Clap, qui me fait découvrir son, son vignoble de Syrah. Alors la Syrah, chez nous, elle dépérit. Donc, euh, alors je, je suis désolé parce que j'avais préparé un texte. Déjà, il tourne la tête. Euh, so j'avais so préparé un texte et, et c'est pas du tout ce que... <rire> Donc, euh, so he gave me a text and uh, he decided not to stick to it whatsoever. But uh, he's basically explaining all of the vignerons that he met along the way that were thrilled to find, <laughs> like Domaine Tempier talking about a Morvedre vineyard, yes. and all those that were thrilled to find somebody, a nurseryman that was going to really focus on giving them quality planting material. Voilà. Pierre Clap me, me, me présente Jean-Louis Chave. Euh, je vais chez, chez Christine Vernet à Condrieux et puis chez Anne-Claude Lefleuve, et si. puis à ce mur Champigny. Ce mur Champigny. <rire> et, 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 et ensuite, on va chez Huette, on finit... Euh, euh, voilà. et, et ça se passe comme ça, en fait. Et, et on s'aperçoit que, vraiment, et là, je suis sérieux, on s'aperçoit que, vraiment, il y a, y, a y a un intérêt pour, pour ce vieux végétal. Et, et, euh, et on a fait, je crois qu'on faisait à peu près 10 000 km par mois. Alors, désolé pour le bilan carbone. Mais la, la, voiture, mais la voiture hybride s'en vient, non C'était nécessaire, Michel, je te promets. C'était nécessaire. Je Donc là, je vais rouler un Nissan, un Nissan. Tu vas en acheter des arbres, toi. Hein. Ouais. Et, et, euh, et en fait, euh, en, en parcourant ce vignoble, en parcourant tout le vignoble français, un tout petit peu européen, on s'est aperçu de... Un gros problème, c'est que le vieux vignoble se comportait très bien, 
et les jeunes vignes dépérissaient. So, to go back just a little bit, there was a, a fair amount of name dropping there of a very fine um, wineries in France, uh, like Jean Louis Chave was one of the examples given. Uh, that started becoming interested, and uh, there was a bit of a snowball effect of wineries uh, discussing this amongst themselves, and then calling Le Lyon, becoming more and more interested, and at one point he was driving 10,000 kilometers a month just to go and meet with all of these new interested clients. Um, and all of that is to say that the world's vineyards are suffering. Euh... J'adore. Jackie, Jackie fait le résumé pour toi. J'ai dû donner un petit résumé parce qu'il y avait quite a lot of, quite a lot of euh, said there. Euh, juste un petit rappel de la période. C'était en 2003. Tout ça. In 2003, this yes. is all happening. Donc en fait, on, on, on sortait d'une période de, 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 où il y avait des températures extrêmes. Et c'est là vraiment qu'on s'est aperçu que le vieux vignoble se comportait mieux que le jeune vignoble. So we were coming out of a time in 2003 of intensive. Uh, chemical practices in the vineyards, and uh, Lillian uh, realized that it was the older vines, those that were older, much older than 20 years old, that were more resistant and hardier than the younger vines. Alors, le, le premier effet, c'était de sortir une feuille blanche et un, et un crayon, et de réécrire euh, le métier de la pépinière comme mon grand-père, en fait, mes deux grands-pères le pratiquaient. So both of his grandfathers were nurserymen, and uh, Lillian decided to go back to the drawing board, take out a blank piece of paper and a pen and rethink the model. Et bon, je vais essayer d'aller vite parce que Michel me fait des, des gros yeux. <laughs> Aujourd'hui, donc on est, on est dans une démarche environnementale. En 2007, on a écrit un cahier des charges avec des vignerons pour produire des plants dans une démarche en bio. On utilise même les pratiques de la biodynamie. So, uh, today, uh, Lillian and others have been um, the authors of a, of a new um, set of guidelines Uh, that become a reference manual for how to act in a vineyard. Toute notre production est greffée en fente. On préfère le greffage en fente que le que le greffage à l'oméga. So he's uh, one of the most important practices is in grafting, going away from the omega graft that uh, you were telling me is um, less respectful to the sap flow, and going back to hand English style grafting. Je suis pour la diversité. Donc vous avez bien compris, en parcourant tous ces vignobles, on a, on a eu la chance de, de visiter des, des parcelles magnifiques. Alors j'ai cité des noms prestigieux, mais on a rencontré et on rencontre encore aujourd'hui des, 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 des pépites, des, des, des vignerons très intéressants, moins connus, mais qui ont un patrimoine viticole exceptionnel. So he has had the, uh, the honor to meet uh, some of the greatest uh, names in wine and, some, and visit some of the best vineyards uh, in Europe. On fait des super rencontres. Il nous arrive aussi des, des, des choses assez rigolotes, puisqu'on a sélectionné un pied de Cabernet Franc dans un poulailler dans le Pays Basque. So, at one time, he uh, went to select a specific, for a massal selection, select a specific vine of Cabernet Sauvignon in a chicken coop in Basque country. Alors, c'est... C'était chez une dame un petit peu âgée. On n'a pas le droit de le faire, mais c'est tellement excitant de, de prendre un peu des travers. Et, et euh, c'est rigolo parce que je, je lisais euh, une conférence de José et qui expliquait l'origine des Cabernet Francs, qui étaient dans le Pays Basque. Voilà. It was funny because it was uh, an older an older lady uh, on this small farm and they had to explain what they were doing there to her. And then you said to José. Donc vous avez compris que euh, <laughs> Le parti euh, José, tu parlais de José. Euh... Oui. <laughs> C'est le direct. Ah, yes, he pre okay. <laughs> Donc, euh, we're, we're talking about climate change, right? <laughs> Relation of, of your work. I wish to parle en anglais. We're going to move on shortly to talk about mass selection. The importance of mass selection over Alors, je dis, on retourne peut-être à la thématique. Alors, le travail, l'importance du travail, mais aussi peut-être parce que les gens sont ici depuis longtemps, donc il faut peut-être un petit peu avancer. Allez, okay. Et, et d'expliquer euh, le, le travail, euh, en fait, ton travail, Lilian, en, en lien avec les changements climatiques, qu'est-ce qui est si important euh, dans ton travail, dans ta philosophie, qui mais, fait en sorte que les gens aujourd'hui sont peut-être mieux préparés? 
Mais ce, ce qui se passe, c'est que ce constat de, de voir ce vignoble, ce jeune vignoble, et je, je parle de ce que j'observe en Europe, ce jeune vignoble qui dépérit très vite, euh, ça, ça, ça nous donne quand même une indication. Et aujourd'hui, euh, depuis le clonage, depuis l'intensification des pratiques, euh, le, les vignes modernes sont, sont dépérissantes. So, um, what Lillian has observed uh, in, his, in, in the field is that um, the world's vineyards are withering and it is the younger vines that are far more susceptible and the older vines, over 20 years old, that are, are far hardier. Et donc, euh, euh, voilà, nous avons repensé chacune de nos pratiques pour rendre le plan plus résistant et pour qu'il puisse bien vieillir et mieux vieillir. Mais ce travail, ce n'est pas seulement le travail d'un pépiniériste. En fait, le problème qu'on a aujourd'hui par rapport au problème climatique, le problème climatique, c'est le coup de grâce d'un vignoble qui est en souffrance. Et il faut que la viticulture prenne conscience de cette situation. Uh, modern viticulture has to realize that the, the vineyard is suffering, that the vineyard, there's increased maladies, uh, increased fine death, and that uh, modern vignerons need to uh, become aware of this and act now. And in his nursery model, he's looking at every practice to make sure we're making more resistant um, biodiverse planting material. Et, euh, euh, et, et ce travail, enfin, si, si on veut vraiment, euh, on ne réglera pas les problèmes climatiques. Enfin, moi, je ne peux pas régler les problèmes climatiques. Moi, je peux tout simplement adapter, un, tout au moins essayer d'adapter un végétal ce que je dis, qui, va, que... qui va permettre, qui va permettre de, 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 de contourner les problèmes climatiques. Oui, bien sûr, mais, mais ce que je voulais dire, c'est de, de, de bien comprendre que pour les gens comprennent bien que le travail que tu fais, en fait, aide justement aux vignerons euh, à s'adapter aux problèmes. Oui, tout à fait. Parce que ton travail va beaucoup plus loin que juste... Euh, il, y a, il, y a production, il y a la production du végétal. Je veux dire que, pour traduire Michel, pour ceux qui ne comprennent pas la question, elle vous encourageait Lillian à expliquer que le travail qu'il fait Uh, is, is the basis, is uh, what will allow the, uh, the vigneron to, uh, to adapt to climate change and to really face these, these issues. Donc oui, il y, y a ce travail de, 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 de production de végétal et puis après il y a cette, cet accompagnement qui est nécessaire auprès de la viticulture. It's working with the, it's the accompagnement, so it's working with, it's accompanying. Uh, the, uh, the vineyards uh, to make sure that they're really um, building the foundations right from planting. La, la, je vais être un peu provocateur. La viticulture a, a pu investir des millions d'euros dans des chais. Maintenant, je crois qu'il faut investir dans le vignoble. Sorry, see, I could... It's very hard to hear from where I'm sitting. Je disais que le, le, la viticulture, les vignerons, on peut investir des millions d'euros dans des chais ou des millions de dollars. Et il faut aujourd'hui investir dans le vignoble. Le, le, le végétal de, va devenir, à mon sens, l'enjeu majeur pour les décennies à venir. So, um, wineries have uh, invested heavily uh, in their uh, wineries, in their, in their facilities, in their cellars, but tomorrow it's going to be far more important to be investing uh, in their planting material. Alors bien évidemment, euh, on l'a dit aujourd'hui, on a parlé de repos des sols, on a parlé de porte-greffe, je crois que euh, on a beaucoup parlé des cépages, de la diversité, et certainement pas suffisamment euh, des porte-greffes. Aujourd'hui, le matériel euh, qui, est, qui est livré par les pépiniéristes en porte-greffe est du matériel cloné. So, we've talked a lot about soils today, we've talked about rootstocks, we've talked about different grape varieties, but going back to the rootstocks, it's the quality that is being delivered by the nursery that is fundamental. Et, euh, et il faudrait réengager un travail euh, euh, sur, ce, sur ce végétal, sur le porte-greffe, parce que tout ce, tout ce qu'on essaie de faire chez nous dans nos ateliers, si vraiment la, la, cette partie inférieure, cette partie qui repose dans le sol est, est de piètre qualité, eh bien on ne fera pas des miracles. Et, et c'est bien le problème, c'est que euh, je, je considère qu'il faut construire un vignoble comme, comme on construit une maison. Et, et les fondations d'un vignoble, c'est la qualité de son système racinaire. So we need to um, construct our vineyards the way we construct our house. We have to start by thinking about the foundations. Uh, and the rootstock is a key element of that foundation. Ça veut dire qu'il faut prendre du temps, il faut laisser reposer les sols. 
You have to take time. You have to allow the soils to rest. J'adore faire du sport. Je fais des, des sommets en altitude. Sauf que quand je, re, je reviens d'un 4000, je ne peux pas repartir après. Quoi. Il faut que je me repose. Et c'est pareil pour la vigne. Une vigne qui a passé 80 ans sur un sol, quand on l'arrache, il faut que le sol se repose. Et après, on peut en réinvestir dedans. Dessus. It's like humans. Uh, if you're doing extreme activities, you need to rest afterwards. Uh, once a, a vineyard has uh, worked a certain number of years, if you're replanting it, you need to allow it time to rest. Il faut réfléchir sur l'encépagement. Euh, you have to think about what grapes you're planting. Oui, et ressortir euh, des cépages qu'on a oubliés, qu'on a, qu a euh, abandonnés, euh, ça fait euh, peut-être une cinquantaine d'années. You have to look at uh, historic, sometimes forgotten grapes, and see if they're well adapted to the site. Oui, j'ai entendu aujourd'hui des, 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 des jolis mots. J'ai entendu œillade, j'ai entendu cunoise, j'ai entendu cinso, j'ai entendu carignan. J'ai entendu euh, aussi dans les, dans les couloirs euh, le gros lot, euh, le pinodonis, tous ces cépages qui aujourd'hui doivent repeupler le vignoble français européen. Il y a des cépages. Heard, uh, so many people today talking about grapes that we would never have been mentioning five years ago. All these grapes that Lilian just mentioned that are they're coming back into parlance. Je crois aussi qu'il faut euh, réfléchir sur ces densités de plantation. Je suis pas un adepte des hautes densités. Je crois We have to think also about um, other factors like planting density. Oui, les, le, 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 au, au plus on met de, de, de pieds à l'hectare, au plus on crée du stress, une concurrence au niveau, au niveau du système racinaire. Donc je suis plus partisan d'avoir de, 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 des, des densités plus faibles. So uh, high density has been um, uh, talked about quite a lot, but the higher the density, the more uh, stress and the more uh, root competition. And so Lilian favors lower density plantings. Et ensuite, après, c'est très personnel, mais je suis aussi pour la complantation. Euh, un de mes meilleurs amis euh, s'appelle Jérôme Bressy. Euh, c'est un vigneron à Rasto. Alors, il aimerait pas que je parle de lui, mais il n'est pas là. Oui. <rire> Talk about Jérôme Bressy and Rasto and his work with. Et euh, il n'est pas là parce qu'il a fini ses vendanges vendredi, euh, samedi. There are people that are adopting the practices that uh, Lilian is favoring today, and I think that Michelle wants to. Cut in here, no? No, I'm just looking at the time, and we have a few other in, uh, speakers, and I, I do want to link it together. Okay. So what I would ask you is there are two more things okay. that you absolutely need to share with us before okay. we, we let the other, the other two speakers um, talk. Ah oui, en français. Alors, il va falloir... On va devoir passer en fait okay. euh, au prochain et, et passer encore deux personnes et je vais vraiment qu'on termine sur une discussion Allez, okay. globale. Est-ce est qu'il y a euh, quelques points absolument que tu veux partager que tu n'as pas non, encore non, fait non. avant pour, pour conclure, je dirais que je suis très bavard. Pour conclure, je dirais que, que euh, on, on, euh, moi je suis pour la viticulture, je, je me suis positionné pour une viticulture de qualité. Euh, ça passera par une grosse réflexion sur la qualité du matériel végétal. Ça passera également par un gros travail de la viticulture. Voilà, je crois que c'est ça le mot, pour moi le mot de la fin. Merci. Ah, C'est rafraîchissant. Katie Jackson, um, Vice President of Sustainability, Jackson Family. Um, we've talked a lot about it, things today, but I think it would be interesting um, linking it to the consumer. Um, You've, you worked, you, you are part now of the association with the Torres family to, um, to have a goal towards reducing the carbon footprint in the wine industry uh, by 2050, I believe is your goal. Um, you have all of these plans, which is great. My question to you is how do we um, share this information to consumer? Mm -hmm. uh, are you planning to have a label? What is in, what is in the... Uh, What is planned ahead? Okay. Um, great. Yeah, no. Uh, um, if it's okay to, to um, just say a tiny bit about um, Jackson Family Wines Absolutely. and IWCA one more time. So, um, and um, then I'd love to talk about um, the consumer. Um, so, um, my family um, owns Jackson Family Wines. We're based out of um, California, um, but we also have vineyards and wineries in Oregon and um, France, Italy, and Australia. Um, and uh, we're a family-owned business, so we 
um, have always wanted to be multi-generational, and um, that's where um, our um, interest in environmental stewardship and then our concern about climate change really dovetails with um, our long-term vision for um, what we want for our winery and, um, and the wine industry um, internationally um, as a whole. Um, so uh, we've been, um, since 2008, we started to um, get a sense of what um, our carbon emissions footprint was um, for our company, and we started doing an inventory, um, and it became, um, as we learned more about how extensive it had to be, it became better and better. Um, and so starting in 2015, um, we had a footprint that we thought um, was uh, thorough and that took into account all three scopes, um, scopes one and two, which are direct emissions, um, and then scopes three, um, which is all of the indirect emissions associated with, for instance, your packaging that you purchase, um, the emissions associated with transporting your, your goods to your consumers, um, and all of those other things that fall into that realm. Um, so we made a goal in 2015 to reduce our emissions 25% um, by 2020, um, and we achieved that goal by um, 2017. Um, and so naturally we wanted to um, think about what the next step was, and um, uh, climate um, change ha is becoming um, more and more apparent um, to be a very urgent issue. Um, and um, in 2017, um, my um, home county in California of Sonoma County had a very devastating wildfire that affected um, 3,000 people's homes, um, thousands of businesses, and um, several wineries and vineyards. Um, and uh, just several weeks ago, we had um, the second really um, most devastating, um, actually it was, it's the most devastating in terms of acreage burnt um, that we've ever had in Sonoma County, um, but luckily less devastating in terms of how many homes it, it um, affected. Um, so we're seeing climate change um, uh, very, in a very um, strong way in um, California. and. Um, so we, we've been thinking about this for a while, and we've been talking with um, the Torres family, um, because as um, Miguel Torres um, told everyone this morning, he's been thinking about climate change very seriously for a very long time now. Um, and he um, had started an association of wineries in Spain um, to, to start creating some goals around um, reducing their carbon emissions. Um, but he decided he wanted to do it on an international scale. So he reached out to us um, starting about a year and a half ago. Um, and um, his goal with the um, IWCA, um, International Winners for Climate Action, was to um, create an association that all members would be, um, who joined would have to um, make some aggressive goals to reduce their emissions um, as um, wineries. And um, the goal, the overall goal is to help um, the entire wine industry understand our footprint and work together to um, decarbonize. Um, so uh, we've... Um, found, we founded it earlier this year. Um, we've had uh, about 10 wineries interested. About four um, have achieved the requirements needed to become members, so we'll be announcing them soon. Um, but our um, long-term goal is to be able to share information um, inside the IWCA with members so that we can help um, each other learn. We can learn from each other to help tackle this problem together because um, our belief is that we're... Our, um, intelligence all coming together will be much more effective than any winery trying to do this alone. Um, and uh, uh, so we've been considering, um, as one way to, to um, speak to the consumer, that there might be a logo associated with IWCA. Um, so if you're a member and um, you've met the um, four requirements, um, and uh, those are to create an inventory um, of your greenhouse gas emissions, um, and have it third party um, audited um, to uh, achieve at least a 25% reduction in your greenhouse gas emissions before you join as a full standing member, and then um, to put in place um, at least 20% um, renewable energy to power your winemaking operations. Um, and, uh, and then the, the last um, requirement is to have those two goals, longer term goals. So the midterm goal is um, in line with the IPCC report, um, the goal of 50% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030. And then um, the long term goal is an 80% reduction by 2045. Um, so um, once you've 
you've committed to those goals and you've achieved those um, three other requirements and become a member, um, you can then put the logo on your bottle of wine um, that says exactly um, how much um, you've been able to achieve in terms of reducing your overall um, carbon emissions to date. Um, and our thoughts are that that will be an easier way um, for our consumers to understand exactly what each winery is doing um, to uh, reduce their impact um, to the planet. Um, so that's one way um, we found it, it's valuable to, to um, one way that we think could be valuable to consumers to um, talk about what we're doing. Um, some of the other things we've done to communicate to our consumers about our sustainability program in general is we've um, held trainings for our um, sales team so that they can go out in the market and really speak to um, the most salient points about what we do. Um, we've put um, our 2015 um, uh, report, which had our, our goals um, in the areas of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but also water, solid waste reduction, um, and actually 10 in total. Um, I won't go into it, but um, it's on our website. Um, and then we have uh, put uh, um, updates on our progress um, every couple of months for the last year. Um, and then um, uh, we also just been going into the market and talking about sustainability. So um, when my family goes and, and um, talks to consumers um, or customers, they share um, what we're doing. Um, and that's all been, I think that's all been very um, helpful in helping the, um, our customer understand why this is important and, um, and what we're doing and, um, and also what they maybe should think about when they're thinking about um, sustainability in wine. Thank you. Um, we've talked a little bit about wine uh, sold on kegs. We've talked about with Pascaline, and I know that you've mm -hmm. tried that. Mm -hmm. Are you increasing the amount of wine you're selling on kegs in restaurants? Um, we so we did try selling wine in kegs. Um, unfortunately, we the program started on a very small trial basis, and um, it wasn't very effective at first. We were seeing some quality issues because. Um, uh, once you put it in a keg, um, it's important for the restaurant to make sure that they're cleaning um, their equipment um, uh, properly. And um, I think that there were some um, restaurants that weren't doing that. And so we were having um, customers complain to us that our wines weren't, um, the quality wasn't what they should be. Um, so we, we trialed that and we, um, we stopped that program a couple of years ago, but we are trying to to reconsider how we could do go about it more effectively and successfully, um, and I know it's something that um, we've heard, had some interest about. So, thank you, Jérémy. C'est à oh, toi. Bonjour. Oh, bonjour. I have Alors, the heavy burden to be the last speaker. Wait, well, it's it's or you can take it happily, or you know, it could be a good thing too. Um, you are the director of a school, Catch, mm -hmm. uh, in in Bordeaux, mm -hmm. and. Um, to you, it's really important to educate um, students about climate change. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you're planning on doing at your school? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to try to be brief because it's been a, a long day for the audience. Um, I could speak about education for quite a while. Um, I think if you listen to the news, and, and sorry to say, but to some of the speakers we've heard today, uh, you might think that the word is lost. Uh, that it's not worth a try, that we should all give it up. Yet we have a wide array of solutions and we have education, which I think is a key. A focus on the concern was probably necessary at some point uh, because we had to raise awareness, uh, we had to warn on the risk, but no, I believe we need to change the message. We need to focus on solutions and on hope. We have a big challenge in fact, we have many challenges. Climate change is a numerous challenges. It's drought, it's heat, it's uh, how to maintain a balance between acidity and, and, uh, and alcohol. It's um, a changing market, because I believe that the market is changing as a response to climate change. People are going back to nature. People want fresher wines. Uh, so there's lots of different challenges in the meantime. The question, the key question, in my view, is how to turn stress, stress into opportunities. Or, or can you take advantage of what's going on? And we all in the room, all the wine professionals, we have a great responsibility. Uh, we need to share. We need to 
teach the others. Uh, we need to learn with them. Uh, we need to highlight the solutions. Uh, we need to invent new solutions, and we will. And that's the most important. Uh, Nelson Mandela once said the most powerful weapon, if you want to change the word, is education. And I think it was true. So what can we tell these new generations? We can tell them that the wine industry can be an example, and I think it can be. We can tell them that they have the opportunity to become better wine growers. And we've, I'm not going to list all the solutions. We went through them today. Uh, but there's lots of solutions in the vineyard. They can become better winemakers, and uh, lots of things have been forgotten. Uh, for instance, if we speak about Cabernet Sauvignon, people will tell you Cabernet Sauvignon is very herbaceous, so you can't go for war bunch fermentation. Yet, these 1919 or 1929, the glorious vintages in the past, we had no distimer at that time, and these wines were fantastic. And with war bunch, you lose 0.6% alcohol. So that's a quite straightforward solution, but it works. You can add water in your wine. In, in Europe, which is kind of paradoxical, we have the right to use pinning cones or reverse osmosis, and we can add water, which is used in, in Australia or California. So there's many simple things we can do to adapt to climate change. We have the opportunity to better understand the market, so to produce fresher wines. I strongly believe that these wines uh, with uh, high alcohol content need less oak, need to, pick, to be picked earlier, need softer extraction. So there's things to do um, to cope with the demand, to understand the market, and the market is always right. So that's very important. And as I said before, uh, I think it's very important we need to stick to take a step back and to ask ourselves, what do we want for the wine industry? What do we want for the future? Should we focus on productivity, on this mass market wine without any story to tell? Or should we focus on less but better? And less but better does not mean very expensive. It might mean identity diversity. If we all agree that the later solution is a better one, then I'm sure we can make it. Sustainability is a very long journey, but with education, with a focus on solutions, we can make it. Provided we give hope, because sad people cannot change the world. That's a pretty good ending. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Jackie has a question. I agree with you on the less is better, but just to play the devil's advocate, is less but better going to provide enough wine for everybody who wants to be drinking wine? Well, actually, you know, in, in Europe, we used to drink uh, 160 liters per year per habitant, oh, and now we, we drink 40 liters, and I think people cope with it. Uh, so I think, and, and less but better also means accepting that uh, sustainability is also economic. So you have to, you have to pay for wine. I mean, the, the reality w uh, behind these mass market wines that uh, were very successful a few years ago, if you take this Australian successful period, these yellow tail era, Sorry for yellow tail. Um, what's behind that story? Behind that story, you have hundreds of wineries uh, uh, which are paid 0.6 euro for a kilo of grapes. Can you live with that? No, you can't. So I, I believe we need to educate the market so that they are ready to pay not a lot of money, but enough money so that people in the vineyard can live and can do a good job. Thank you. Yes, Eric? Thank you again. Uh, this question is for Lilian. Um, you spoke about uh, the importance of, of good quality rootstock before, and I'm, uh, I never really thought about this issue. Do you mean um, 
the uh, wise match of vine and rootstock, as Jose was talking about before, or do you mean something innate in, in the quality of the, the rootstock? And if so, what? Je parle de la qualité du porte-greffe. Il y a euh, une le quarantaine d'années, mon père euh, avait une massale, enfin les pépiniéristes avaient une massale de porte-greffe. On, on appelait cette catégorie la catégorie élite. He created a category called élite. Uh, élite. élite. Et dans les années 70-80, on a fait arracher tout ce vignoble euh, aux pépiniéristes pour planter du matériel cloné. In the 70s and 80s, all of this vineyard of elite rootstocks were uprooted uh, to plant. Qu'est-ce qui, qu qui était planté à la place? Du matériel certifié, du matériel cloné. For, to, to plant clones. Et euh, mon père m'expliquait que euh, ce vignoble qui a été arraché avait 30, 40, 50 ans, était dans un état sanitaire exceptionnel, il n'y avait aucun dépérissement. So this, uh, this uh, uprooted uh, vineyard was in perfect sanitary condition, it was 40 to 50 years old, uh, but it was uprooted anyway, because people were looking Et for clones, c'est ça, ils cherchaient des clones, people wanted clones. Et aujourd'hui, je vous invite vraiment à venir visiter le, le vignoble de Porte-Greffe en Europe, euh, qui est peuplé de, 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 de quelques individus. So, uh, now in nurseries, uh, rootstock vineyards just have a few individuals in them. Et là, il y a une grosse défaillance, vraiment une, une terrible défaillance. Et là, vraiment, les conditions climatiques viennent, viennent mettre, je, je reprends le terme, le, le coup de grâce sur ce vignoble qui est en, qui est en, en souffrance. There's a terrible lack, uh, it's almost the final blow to the, uh, to the, to the vineyard. Et, et faire un plan de vigne, c'est comme une, une belle recette, il faut de la belle matière première, so sauf que là, il y a vraiment une défaillance sur le porte-greffe. Creating a vineyard is like uh, making a recipe, you've got to start with good material, you've got to start with good quality food to make a good meal. Thank you. Une question pour euh, Lilian. On a beaucoup parlé hier soir euh, de, de votre expérience. Euh, moi, ce qu'on m'a inculqué à l'école, justement, à l'époque, c'était vraiment la massive production au niveau des pépinières. Donc, euh, ce que vous évoquez aujourd'hui, j'avais une question un peu plus technique, en fait, de savoir qu'est-ce qu'il faut différencier, en fait, des, des pépinières classiques. Comment travaillez-vous, justement, à l'adaptation porte-greffon, pardon, surtout avec des cépages anciens ou autochtones euh, dont on ne connaît peut-être pas beaucoup euh, la génétique, etc. So, uh, the question was, uh, what is the difference between a classic or traditional nursery today and a nursery like Lidion's in terms of uh, the rootstock uh, and the vine matching, in terms of the quality he's using, especially in terms of uh, ancestral uh, forgotten grape varieties? Bon, déjà chez nous, euh, nos pratiques sont différentes du marché conventionnel. Comme je l'ai expliqué rapidement, les modes de greffe sont différents. Uh, our practices are uh, completely different, uh, especially when it comes to grafting. Our, our grafting method is different. Nous avons, euh, nous sommes la seule pépinière qui existe à, à être autonome euh, sur son matériel végétal, sur ses terres labourables. So we're uh, one, of, one of the only uh, nurseries to be completely independent when it comes to our planting materials, especially our rootstocks, our varieties. Pas de négoce de plants chez nous? Uh, we don't trade uh, varieties. We don't do any grape trading. Voilà, enfin, une, série de, une série de pratiques euh, bon, différentes de, du, marché, du marché habituel. Uh, it's, a, it's just an entire series of practices that are different from what happens in a traditional après, après, ce qui différencie, je pense, la, la, notre pépinière, c'est l'approche. Parce, approach. parce, que, parce que je considère que euh, chaque vigneron est différent, chaque attente est différente. Sort of 
uh, practice, he considers that each winery, each vigneron is different, and so he adapts differently to their needs. Les, les régions sont différentes. The regions are different. Les cépages. The grapes are les terroirs. The terroirs. Et nous, on est des... Enfin, moi, je considère, je suis euh, une personne qui doit m'adapter à chacun des besoins, et chaque, chaque, vraiment, chaque cas est différent, à nous de nous adapter à chacun des besoins. So yeah. it's up to the nursery, it's up to Lillian to uh, adapt to each individual situation. Et, et en, prenant du, en prenant le temps. In, en prenant le temps. En prenant son temps. Oh, and on taking, taking his time to make sure it's done correctly. Et c'est comme ça qu'on arrivera, <laughs> à mon avis, and this is how we will uh, be uh, able to à, à construire <laughs> des vignobles durablement. Uh, look after vineyards in a sustainable way for the future. Très bien. Je sais que I know that we've passed a bit of time today with a snowstorm and we ended up starting late. So for those who are view are still here, I really appreciate it. Um, I just received a little piece of paper. Just want to end on a few things. Um, so today, to compensate the carbon footprint of this event, uh, we add a total of 22 tons of CO2. Um, so we will be donating today $1,200 and plant 200 trees in Canada. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for taking the time. It was a long day. It means a lot that till the, the very end you're still asking questions. Uh, this is just the beginning. We will be here. I will be back in two years now. I will do this again. Uh, let's get together, talk more about this exchange idea. Um, like Jeremy said it so well, um, it's easy to be alarmist. There's definitely urgency. But at the end of the day, I think that we have to look at solutions, move forward to make this place a better place. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.